trash here at the Waitakere City Council Refuse and Recycling Transfer Station stand as an unpleasant monument to our insatiable and careless consumerism. But our eagerness to dump what we no longer desire is not just limited to objects. It also applies to ideas and people. Every three years, New Zealand undergoes a nationwide stock take. It's the process by which we decide what we value, what we want to keep, and what we want to consign to the waste heap. That process is something that consumes the country for months on end. It's also something that can change the course of the nation in a single night. Election night telecast lit up our screens in 1969. Good evening. Welcome to Studio One in Wellington, the centre for tonight's television network coverage of today's election result. The challenge was to make this dirge of democracy into something remotely comprehensible. Well, Bob Chapman just moved over to the board. What's happening, Bob? Yes. Yeah, well, what I'd like to do is to summarise the situation so far. Raglan lost one. Wanganui gained two, so they've gained two from the government and lost one. In fact, they've gained three, lost one. With the fate of the nation on the line, this was television's big night. Welcome to Avalon, tonight, information centre of the country. This is election central for the special network coverage of the 1972 general election. Just a moment ago, the booths closed and the general election 1978 was decided. Election night has always been a showcase for the very best of our information processing technologies. We're going to be bringing you the results at computer speed. The nation's most powerful computers were commandeered for the big night. Good evening, viewers of Television One. My function tonight is to display the election results, the finals, and to carry out calculations using my superior memory. I shall be able to do this so much faster than you lesser more. It wasn't just talking computers. Analog technology, too, was being pushed to the very limit. For an example, um, we'll take Electric 73, which happens to be Timaru, and let's, for example, say that... Now that would suggest Timaru. that Tumaru's gone national, which would in be... In that a, case, it would be a change. In that case, I will then stick on a change, which is pretty obvious. Yeah. If, for example, um, it's a real change and values or social credit get a seat, then in that case, we have a graphic artist who's working on, on their symbols, and I'll just completely stick a... Uh, you know. So, social credit values, we're ready for you too. We put our faith in these technologies to predict swing in the electorate, and magically foretell our collective fate. And it goes up like this to around about there. Then the government changes and drops the run. The ultimate oracle was the swingometer. Of course, on the other hand, it could go down here, and then it just might build. You never know. What exactly is swim? I don't know. Neither does anyone else. Subsequent versions proved equally useless, including the mysterious swing worm of 93. You can see it there, calculated progressively from our indicator booths as they come in. On air, we were state of the art. To help you see at a glance what's happening as the results come in, we've got a series of Apple computer displays. Let's take a look at those. <coughs> but behind the scenes, it was a different story. Colin, you're saying that the system is, is completely bloody haywire, is it? I, well, I, I, I can't trust it. Um, uh, it's saying some rather confusing things. When the computers didn't work, there was always Dougal. Bartram, values, 352. Gill, national, 1749. 
looking like some kind of news oompa loompa, Dougal reliably droned on for democracy. Lord, social credit, 140, and Stanton, Labour, 1131. It's a marvellous night for a moon dance. But it wasn't all boring numbers. There were musical numbers, wacky golfers. Well, yes, and one to the cheek for Mr Rowling. You're certainly balancing it up. And racist comedy. Tell me, sir, how would your household vote? Well, 36 national, 24 labour, 13 social credit and 14 values, uh, but I can't speak for the ones upstairs. During the Muldoon years, a more relaxed attitude to smoking helped create the cabaret atmosphere of a speakeasy, complete with local laureates. So I'll tell you a little part, and it's called I Speak to the Nation. G'day, gorgeous. Your ultimate accountant. You should have made him years back. Someone should have told you that. A man with muscles for cheeks, cheeks where his muscles should be, New Zealand's Mussolini. I'm just a lover in black, bloodshot from a bout of you. I have long since turned my back, long since known just what to do. Beyond all proposition, I've joined your opposition. But no matter how good the poetry or political prose, State TV's attempt to turn election night into a carnival was like putting lipstick on a pig. Here, pig, pig. We longed for a more exhilarating spectacle and went looking for it in strange places. The party, too, is laid on a good supper this time and uh, it's got uh, featured sandwiches and rather large pie, uh, filled French rolls. Unlike three years ago when a shock defeat sent Labour supporters back home, this time the supper is expected to be consumed. So from Weir House, Labour Party headquarters, it's back to Ian Johnson. And when the excitement finally did come, Three, we could two, hardly contain one, ourselves. Decision 99, I think we can say right now we've got the first um, drama of the um, yeah. evening. What you're looking at there is the Labour Party back. party room, the actual fun fun party room, and a lift is being priced apart. Jackie Maher, I don't know if you can hear me, but what's happening? This is where Helen Clark is expected at the Avondale race course later on. We've got drama with the lift. What is it, Jackie? Four children or four young people are stuck in this lift, Paul. We're just trying to get them out now. They've been in here for about 10 or 15 minutes or so. Certainly some very savage um, dealing the lift is, uh, is going on, and... Um, there was more drama in 96 when a fire alarm rained on Axe election night parade. We're also going to take you now live to the Chicago bar in Wellington and you can hear that alarm ringing in the background. We were at the Chicago bar before of course. It is the party headquarters tonight of ACT. We were talking to Richard Preble there. He's not there anymore because the Chicago bar has been evacuated as a result of a fire alarm. Hello, we have breaking news right now. But nothing could top election night 05, when a senseless Cessna buzzed the sky tower. A light plane has reportedly been taken unlawfully from Ardmore Airport and has flown dangerously low over central Auckland. I went out and had a look. And as you're looking up over Mark Sainsbury's gleaming head, towards the sky tower. I could see the wreckage, you know, if it occurred, falling backwards onto the set live on camera. Standing by in the, in the uh, Wellington studios at Avalon as a backup was, I think, Peter Williams. And Peter was sitting there with a wine glass in hand watching the coverage on television. You can see the f phone call come through that he may be called on to go live to air and pick up the pieces. And I've never seen, I mean, he's grey anyway, and he's a lovely man, but he just went white. And you can see him go, what do I do with the glass? We all secretly hoped for our own little September 11. But this was no jihad. It was jihadly anything. And sadly, the plane fell to earth at Kohimarama, like a poison seagull. The crash was uh, close to National Party leader Don Brash's house. This is a live shot from our chopper in the area at the moment. 
Whilst trawling through election night film strips may seem like a never-ending smorgasbord of monotony, there are some tasty morsels to be found, the most memorable of which are the moments we weren't meant to masticate. Nuggets of behind-the-scenes informality can often be found in recordings made during the ad breaks. Here's Holmesy enjoying a quiet fag in 1990. And Ian Fraser slagging off Muldoon to former national leader Jack Marshall in 1981. I'm up to feeling happy if uh, that bastard is thrown out of office, actually. A number of the top brass of TVNZ had sat down and they had reviewed the entire tapes of the election night broadcast. And here was this moment where Jack Marshall and I were taking far too much malicious joy at the possibility that Muldoon was, was actually gone. And um, I nearly lost my job. Yeah. Your bald patch is, is showing on, man. Yeah. So will your, yours be, <laughs> man. That's why you're on the program. <laughs> By the early 1980s, New Zealand had become a feudal economy. The prices you charged, the hours you worked, the wages you were paid, what you could buy and when, were all decided by the state. Government regulations had made New Zealand into the most boring country in the OECD. Even our biggest cities looked like a scene from the quiet earth, only without the benefit of Bruno Lawrence and that ginger chick. Closed. We might as well go back to the hotel. There's nothing to do here. Just as Orwell foretold, 1984 signalled the age of Big Brother in New Zealand. But our Big Brother was not the faceless entity that Orwell imagined. He was a small man who seemed to rule the country with nothing more than a terrifying scowl. That man was... Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Robert Muldoon. Uh, we're, we're going to be just a, a government of the ordinary bloke and, uh, well, time will tell. But more terrifying than Muldoon's scowl was the state of the economy. People didn't know that we borrowed one... The Treasury and the Reserve Bank borrowed $1.7 billion in four weeks in order to prop up the currency in the country. With the economy on the point of collapse, Muldoon made a fateful decision. But not before consulting two of his closest allies. Brandy and Dry was the Prime Minister's favourite tipple. And there's no doubt that he'd knocked back quite a few the night he made an announcement which was to change the course of New Zealand history. Late at night, on the 14th of June 1984, a somewhat tired and emotional Prime Minister summoned a surprise parliamentary press gallery to announce a snap election in four weeks' time. That doesn't give you much time to run up to an election, Prime Minister. Doesn't give my opponents much time to run up to an election, does it? The moment was so iconic, it was later immortalised in the TV drama... There will out. be an election in four weeks' time. There will be our lot against the other lot. <laughs> it was the Prime Minister's notorious drunkenness which caught the imagination of the TV dramatists. I've done the right thing, I'm not. And with good reason. I mean, let's be frank about it. Sir Robert was a drinker. And, uh, and drank a lot. And we saw, we, we as journalists knew that. Did it affect his judgment? I think people would argue that the night he called the snap election it had. He just did his bananas, he lost his baskets, whatever way you like to put it. That's it! That's it. <laughs> right? Yep, that's it. The party line put the blame on the PM's diabetes. You saying he was as diabetic as a newt? Well... Muldoon's surprise move caught everyone on the hop, even his own party president. Come on, Madam President, we're going to talk to the press. I'm not ready, I look dreadful. Rob, Rob, Rob. How much warning did you have that this was coming up? Uh, 
Miss Wood? She stayed very close all the way through. Well, obviously, I keep in close touch. I knew nothing about this, and nor I realise now was I meant to. How long ago did you anticipate there would be an early election? It was only this afternoon. Yeah. But we've been talking about this as an option for quite a long time. Uh, you can't govern without an effective, assured majority. I didn't believe for one second that he could win an election. So there I was in front of the cameras rolling with the Prime Minister saying, we're going to win, aren't we, Sue? <laughs> OK. Right. <laughs> <laughs> With no time to digest the big issues, Election 84 became a battle of the leaders. And the battleground, more than ever before, was television. You I really should tell them who okay, they are. Here we go again, you see. But aren't I, aren't I allowed see, to interrupt, Mr. No, 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 I thought yes, this was yes, a debate. Yes, yes, but I just wondered if I might be allowed to interrupt to say something. Yes, of course. See, thanks, Mr. Prime Minister. Yes. It's very generous of you. Not generous, that's part is, of the debate. Yes, well, if you were to just contain yourself and control yourself briefly, we might be able to get some issues. No, no, no abuse, Mr. Lange. There's no question of any abuse there. Thank you very much, Mr. Lange. you, Mr. Lange. Thank you. Television also took us backstage. For the first time, we were able to watch the leaders watching each other. Because the Prime Minister thinks that he can fool you for another month. Not the principal. Too long, eh? On the public debt. What is the point where people stop concentrating? He spends most of his time marrying Japanese these days, eh? Muldoon flirted with the makeup lady just as he hoped to flirt with the electorate. Just the same old face, I'm sorry. Beautiful. Ah. <laughs> but even he had grown tired of his own message. Uh, last time I was bored on the fourth week. We're not having a fourth week this time. I was giving the same speech every night and you know, I was virtually going to sleep in the middle of my own speech because I'd heard it so many times. We've got time for just one more round of that. It didn't help that the national campaign appeared to be about as well organised as an orgy in a fish shop. It got off to a rather symbolically bad start, I always thought, in the Wellington Town Hall, when Hugh Templeton led the audience singing Land of Hope and Glory. The timing was wrong. They gave three standing ovations before Muldoon actually entered the hall. seats at the PM's Rotorua rally were a plastic portent of a tide on the turn. Worse for National, there was a new show in town, attracting full houses with its own charismatic frontman. Do you believe in strong leadership, mate? Because I'm going to come down there and give you some shortly, so watch yourself. <laughs> now, I'm going to give you one warning. That's the ugly fellow. These people have come along to listen to what I've got to say, and I... Go away if you don't like it, but I've given you your warning. You're out of here. I'll throw you out myself if there's one more peep from you, all right? The New Zealand party proved to be the final nail in National's coffin. Bob and Rob were old friends and such great rivals, they even raced each other to the 84 leaders' debate. We were belting along the motorway into Wellington. Charles was driving and back at me, Alongside comes the Prime Minister. He looks across, he sees me. I saw him bark at the driver, put your foot down. I put your foot down, Charles. <laughs> and we got, must have got up to about 140 miles an hour through the rain. Nobody on the road Sunday night, you know, just... I said, ram him, ram him, ram him. <laughs> Charles was scared to ram him. And <laughs> so he started edging. I said, ram him. <laughs> and Mulder was shouting his driver. Doubtless the same thing. Uh, I could see his driver was looking very pallid. <laughs> of all the election night magic moments, it's hard to go past the highly charged emotional communion known as the concession call. Hello? OK, pass the phone. Here we go, sir. Prime Minister. Ah, uh, Jim Walter. Congratulations. Thanks very much, Bill. Uh, it's a sad moment for you. Uh, 
I experienced it three years ago, and, uh, well, there'll be other occasions in the future. It'll be very quiet, please. Joan's OK? Uh, she's in tremendous. She's with you? And Yvonne's well? Yep, that's good. That's good. No, thank you for that. Both lucky. Oh, you know, we're, we're very lucky. And, uh, I shall see you in a certain place at a certain time. Come on now. The first inkling something was badly wrong came on election night when David Longy took the call from Sir Robert conceding defeat. Thanks very much for ringing. Cheerio. Thanks, oh, That's good. Thank you. Good. Sadly, the age of the concession call has come to an end thanks to the introduction of MMP. We both know that under MMP, the bronze medal winner decides who gets the gold and who gets the silver medal, and may the best negotiation win. Of all our dates with democracy, election night is the most engrossing, for nothing is quite as exciting as uncertainty. Can I have your attention, please? The winds of change that blow through halls like this have always brought a welcome change in the weather. Behind me we have a Prime Minister. And although the three years ahead may well end in tears, if nothing else, election night is a great excuse for a party. In this, our Aotearoa, land of elections. Public debt. What is the that point that? where people stop concentrating? It means that the government has spent less on education, less on health, less on